Hi, and welcome to another episode of Tea with Tara. I'm joined today by Elena Doton. Did I say that right? Yes, yeah, Elena Doton. Executive Director for the F. Scott Fitzgerald Museum. Elena, welcome. Thank you. We're actually the Scott and Zelda Fitzgerald Museum. We're both. Oh, okay. Yes, we're we are in Montgomery, Alabama, and we're Zelda's hometown. So. Oh wow. We're both. Yeah. Okay, so I want to start with Scott, because F. Scott, of course, went by yeah. Scott, right? So um, can you tell me a little about his life growing up and um, maybe a little about how he decided to become a writer, if he was influenced by anybody? Yeah, he uh, primarily grew up in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, his father, they had moved to Buffalo when he was young and then moved back to St. Paul. His father was kind of unsuccessful in business. His mother, it was obviously Irish, um, and her family were kind of wealthy tradespeople, I think grocery and whatnot. So he described himself as the poorest boy on the richest street. He lived on Summit Avenue in uh, St. Paul. And in terms of his, like, his early writing career, he wrote um, when he was young. He had a wealthy aunt that sent him to Newman, which was or still is a very prominent um, boarding school in New Jersey. And so he wrote kind of plays, um, short stories. He has his diary when he's quite, quite young. And then he goes to Princeton. And at Princeton, most people don't know that Fitzgerald was a huge football fan. He was a high school quarterback. Um, people think that he was short. He was 5'9", but in 1920, the average man was about 5'7". But he was eventually cut or cut at the on the Princeton team. And he goes to the Triangle Club, which was Princeton's theatrical society. Um, and it was very uh, influential at the time. So he begins writing for them and joins other writing groups on campus. He was not a great student, but I think that's when he really begins to write in earnest. And then finally, uh, he was stationed here in Montgomery most of his class, most of his Princeton class withdrew and then, um, I don't know if enlisted, but they, um, you know, joined the war. It's one of the last, World War One's one of the last wars where the elite went to war. And it was here in Montgomery that he wrote the first draft of his first novel, This Side of Paradise. Is it true, though, that he, he dropped out of Princeton? Is that correct? That he, he actually... didn't, yes and no. When we think about people dropping out, it means, you know, they just leave school and don't finish. But he was, it was World War One, and almost his entire class withdrew. Here at the museum, we have um, any Princetonian, it was all men at that time, who, who left to join the war effort were given a certificate of merit. And we have his actual certificate here at um, from Princeton in lieu of graduating. However, he would have been class of 17 and he was posthumously graduated with the class of 2017. So, you know, it's a, yeah. Uh, he was not a great student, had very bad grades, but um, he didn't, some will say he, he, he joined the war effort because he would have um, not done well in school. But we know that he took being a veteran very seriously. Um, I don't think most people realize how athletic he was, that um, how much that career as a veteran meant to him and, and his regret that he was never actually deployed. So on the cusp of, he, he was on the cusp of deployment when the armistice was called. And one of the great regrets of his life was not being deployed. And I don't think people realize he was also a great military historian as well. So to say that he dropped out, I mean, it's kind of factual versus accurate. Yeah. So it's when he was in the in the army that he meets Zelda, correct? Yes, he was stationed first, I think, uh, in Kentucky, and then here in Montgomery. He was at what was known as Camp Sheridan. Um, there were two here. After the Wright brothers are at Kitty Hawk, they established two flight schools in the U.S., and the other, was, one was in Ohio, but the other was here in Montgomery, and we still have the Air War College. So he was stationed here at Camp Sheridan, and you have Camp Taylor, which was the Air War College. And it was while stationed here that they met. Um, they met at a, um, a dance at the Montgomery Country Club. But the, and the Country Club still, the original building is no longer there. It burns in 25. However, when you 
country clubs then were more like sporting clubs. I mean, when you see the pictures of it, it looks like a barn almost, or like a like a a cabin. It, it's not what you think of country clubs today, but they did meet here in Montgomery in the neighborhood where the museum is at the Montgomery Country Club. So can you talk a little about Zelda's background and how her background differed a little bit from Scott's? Yeah, there's there's a lot more myth or uh, I think misunderstanding around Zelda. Montgomery is Zelda's hometown. Her father was a state Supreme Court judge here. And I think a lot of people, and, and I've seen it in the biographies, they assume that Zelda's family were quite conservative, Southern, post-Civil War. But in fact, her parents were quite bohemian. Um, her father was known um, as a judge for never having a, um, a case overturned. But he he wasn't as strict as people think. For example, today's like the the repeal of prohibition, you know, on this day in '33, and her father ruled that you could not drink in public, but that you what you did in the privacy of your own home was your business. So it wasn't an absolute prohibition here. Uh, her mother was an accomplished writer. Most people don't realize both Zelda's mother and two of her sisters were writers. Um, her mother had published short stories nationally, but also had published on um, vocal training. Her mother was quite musical, had been offered a part by the Barrymores, which her father um, forced her to uh, refuse. Zelda's, both of Zelda's grandfathers were state senators. Her maternal grandfather ran for president and you couldn't have an actor in the family. And that's how Zelda's mother comes to Montgomery. Um, her sister Rosalind was also a writer, was a society reporter for the newspaper here, uh, then went to Birmingham, which was you know, a larger market. And when she couldn't be a regular reporter, she um, quit and was one of the first women to work at a bank. So I think a lot of people assume that Zelda was this wild child and that she was this rebel, which when in fact, um, we think she was trying to catch up to her mother and her sisters, if that makes sense. It does. And, you know, actually, I've seen some, I have seen and heard that she was kind of wild and that they yeah. have a wild existence together. Mm -hmm. But uh, mm -hmm. now when she meets Scott and they start courting, mm -hmm. there was a lot riding on that relationship or not on that relationship, but rather on Scott becoming, uh, making a name for himself. So when he writes his first book, This Side of Paradise, was there a lot riding on that in terms of he needed to be more successful before she would accept his hand in marriage? Yeah, they they were engaged. And when the armistice called, he had a job as a um, like an advertising copywriter. And he could hardly support himself. And she ends up breaking the engagement. I think one of the myths is that they people assume Zelda was the Southern Belle when she wasn't. Again, she came from this kind of bohemian family. And Zelda was the youngest of her sisters to marry. All of her sisters married later. So there was really no pressure on her to marry. Uh, I think a lot of people think that because she was this, quote, Southern Belle, which is not a term that you find used in Alabama at all in, at, at, at her age um, or when she was young. But so there was no pressure on her family to make a successful marriage match. Um, when So Scott was very unsuccessful in New York, and he goes back home to uh, St. Paul and rewrites The Side of Paradise, and it does. It becomes this overnight success. Um, it was almost immediately reprinted, and he becomes like the hottest um, author in the country. And we know there's an anecdote. One of his classmates, Lawton Campbell, was from Montgomery, and Lawton Campbell knew Zelda uh, and, and described Scott holding, we have a picture of him holding it up and that he's going, he was, Lawton Campbell saw him on his way to Montgomery to effectively propose. So um, I think it, it's one of those, it's in the middle. Yes, she didn't marry him, but he, he couldn't support himself, but it, it was not as if um, that was the only criteria. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. did did her family approve of him then? Um, I think initially, yes. They were married at St. Patrick's Cathedral. One of his cousins was a priest there. 
Uh, her parents did not go to the wedding. However, one of her sisters was a chaperone uh, with her on the train. Uh, her sister Tilly had married um, a kind of high-end Madison Avenue advertising guy and was living in New York. Her sister Rosalind had married uh, then Captain Newman Smith. They were in New York. Her sister, one of her sisters, went with her. Um, so in terms of the family, when Tilly was married, she was married in New Orleans and the parents didn't go either, which is a little bit of a mystery for us. But I think initially they were they were happy for it. Her parents were also, she came from, um, uh, her parents were Episcopalian, but they went to a very liberal church for that time as well. So they weren't st very strictly religious people. I think people have this notion that Zelda came from this very strict Southern background, but they just weren't. So her family, again, were very bohemian um, because she married Scott, who was Catholic. Right. So, and, yeah. and I actually... so I don't think that that was an, an issue. Yeah. Yeah. And I heard that his religion was an issue. And of course, I'm glad you're clearing that up because I had read something, be careful what you read on the internet, but that they said something, someone wrote about his religion being a problem. For her parents? Yeah. No, I, I don't think so. I think people assume that because they didn't go to the wedding. But when you look at the family history, um, the fam the parents didn't go to the sisters. And we know that that marriage was very happy. The other thing that people don't seem to realize about the 20s is that after the First World War, it was very common to elope. Marriages kind of the, the way that we think of weddings and these big weddings, um, it wasn't the case yet. And also um, just cultural history, you know, the diamond ring for your engagement ring, that really wasn't, it, it was becoming into fashion. Of course, it was a marketing campaign and we all know De Beers and whatnot. But um, like Zelda wore a, a midnight blue suit to her wedding. So the idea of this big wedding that we think of today with the white dress, it wasn't, it was coming into fashion, but it wasn't at the time. So I think we kind of look backwards and we don't understand that, that really interesting window at the beginning of the 20s when eloping was actually the fashion instead of a large wedding. So with the success of Scott's first book, This Side of Paradise, they were living in New York at the time, correct? Yeah, they, they, I think of, they stay at the Commodore Hotel. Um, they just go wild. Yeah, yeah. did they have uh, a yeah. wild existence in New York? Yeah. A while there being like they, a toast of the town? out of various, I think the Commodore, and I've gone blank, the Ritz. Um, they get kicked out of one hotel. They're known for like riding on the tops of taxis. Zelda was known for swimming in the fountain in 1922. It's the, um, it's not the Zigfield Follies, it's the Greenwich Village Follies have a big overture curtain. Uh, I believe Reginald Marsh painted it and, you know, you like spot the celebrity in the curtain. And Scott was featured in, I think, a car, some kind of car or truck with riders, but Zelda is seen diving into the fountain. Um, and I don't think we realize today how famous they were during that period. They are like one of the hottest media couples. Right. Which I think is is very rare in that Zelda and Scott were a couple, and he was the hot writer. Um, whereas you other see other people, you you don't even hardly know who their wives are. Yeah, because writers were really treated like rock stars in his day. Oh yeah, well we forget in like 1920, he has the hottest novel in the country. It was I think in its eighth. It comes out in I believe April. March or April, and it's in its eighth printing by August. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, he also had six hit stories uh, in the Saturday Evening Post. And we and there weren't really movies yet. You didn't really have um, radio plays yet. It was 1920. So I think the circulation of the Saturday Evening Post in 1920 was about 12 million households. Not just people, but households. Um, so if you have the top six stories and that, and you have the top film, it would be like the equivalent of having the top movies and top TV shows for an entire right. year. Yeah. yeah, that's amazing. And they became synonymous with the jazz age. Yes. Um, the reason they become synonymous with the jazz age is 22, September of 22 is the 100th anniversary of the publication of Scott's collected story, Tales of the Jazz Age. 
he coins the term the ta jazz age. But what most people don't realize is when you talk about the jazz age, we think that it's mainly um, parties and music, jazz, obviously, but he was really describing the social upheaval of the time. Um, in, in one of the stories in Tales of the Jazz Age, in the introduction, I think it's for May Day, which is about, um, it's, it's about um, like a, a riot, and there's a question of, of socialists taking over in the, in, the inter, in the years between, you know, af immediately after the First World War. And so when he calls it Tales of the Jazz Age, it's kind of about social upheaval. But we think of it as a party now, you know, the big Gatsby party. Yeah. And she was known as the first flapper. Now, did Scott, was he the one who came yeah, up with that? Yeah, he her as the first flapper, yeah. So in, in 1921, Frances Scotty Fitzgerald, their daughter, was born. Mm -hmm. What kind of parents were Scott and Zelda? I think she it was kind of, if anyone's watched Downton Abbey, that type of thing, she had nannies almost from birth. Uh, when they live here in the house, which is a museum, they lived here from 31 to 32. She had a nanny from almost birth till when they were here. And then when they go to Baltimore, she went into boarding school. So you think about parents, um, they weren't traditional parents in the sense of today. So it's a little hard to judge. Um, when Zelda in the later 20s turns to ballet and the marriage is beginning to break down. Um, there's, I think internal, there's a strife in the marriage because Scott's always picking the nannies and Zelda I think feels a little estranged. Um, there's a very famous or um, Scotty Fitzgerald published in Esquire. It was letters that Scott had sent her uh, advice as a father and he could be quite pedantic at times so um scotty fitzgerald moved back to montgomery in the late 60s and lived in the neighborhood here where the museum is until her death and quite a number of her friends are actually still alive and they all said we, we just had the um Zelda, there's a fountain dedicated to zelda which scotty fitzgerald dedicated in the early 70s and we had it repaired with the neighborhood and just had the dedication. And they reread Scotty's words at that dedication. And she she more or less said, I, you know, I hate to disappoint you all, but I had a very good childhood. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I think people think with her parents partying and whatnot, right. uh, so that maybe tumultuous. I think it was tumultuous in her latter years, but not her childhood. So at what point does Zelda start her writing career? And was there any jealousy at all between Scott and Zelda over her becoming yeah. a writer now? Um, in the latter years, I think there, 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 you know, some ways four great myths about Zelda. One is that we hear is people think Scott plagiarized her. I'm a Zelda scholar, and I do not think he plagiarized her. And I can explain that. The other is that she started ballet at 27. That is not true. She. Um, We've done quite a lot of research. She started ballet here when she was quite young. And the other has to do with her, her mental health. But in terms of being a writer, she wrote, she won a contest, um, and I'm just going blank, um, when she was in high school. Again, most people don't realize her mother was a very accomplished writer, had been published nationally. Her sister, Rosalind, um, had been a professional, even though it was a society reporter, that was the only avenue open to women at that time. Um, Zelda also, uh, in Montgomery in 1914, there was something called the Press and Authors Club was formed. And it was formed by Marie Bankhead Owen, who was the aunt of Tallulah Bankhead. This is how Zelda grew up with Tallulah Bankhead. Um, and, and that Press and Authors Club still meets today. It's four women. Uh, and still meets at the museum today. And Zelda's mother, sister, Marie Bankhead Owen, and then Kate Slaughter McKinney, who, who becomes the poet laureate of the state of Alabama, all were in that inaugural group and founded this professional women's writers group. So Zelda was, I do believe, um, a very talented writer. People will say that Scott plagiarized her, and I can explain why I don't think so. 
Uh, I think he was a superior writer. His criticism of Zelda was that she didn't like to edit. So she would dash these stories off and then he would edit them. And in their early marriage in the 20s, she writes a review of his second novel called Friends Husbands Latest, which is his tongue in cheek review of Beautiful and Damned. And in it, she makes the illusion that plagiarism begins at home and she alludes to I recognize things from my diary. And people will point to this and say, see, he plagiarized her. But what it was, it was a very clever PR trick to elevate her as a writer because he's he's just white hot. He's the hottest writer in America. And in a way, it, when you say, oh, he's you know taking stuff from my diaries, it's elevating her as a writer. So I think the evidence that proves that he was initially very supportive of her is used posthumously against him. Does that make sense? Yes. And also, in when people read Tales of the Jazz Age, Scott writes these introductions to each story. They're kind of comical introductions. But in one, uh, it's called The Jelly Bean, which is set here in Montgomery. It's about a party at the country club. Um, and... My, and well, it's, they're called the Tarleton stories, but it's about Montgomery and it's, it's, it's kind of the party that some, like the circumstances under which they met. And he says, uh, for this portion of the story, I turned it over to my wife being a Southern girl. So even then he's, you know, giving her, he's telling his audience, hey, my wife's a writer too. But in the thirties, when they come back from Europe, Zelda, and they were here in Montgomery, they go to Baltimore, Zelda's at Johns Hopkins, she writes Save Me the Waltz. And the marriage is um, the marriage is very much on the rocks. And this is my belief, it's not explicit in the, the record. But we know when she was in Montgomery, she did talk to someone about possibly getting a divorce. And then in Baltimore, they kind of negotiate, were they going to get a divorce or not? Because she secretly writes Save Me the Waltz and sends it to Scott's um, agent, to the publishers. Scribner's accepts it, and he finds out he's furious. Because it's the same material that he was using for Tender as the Night. So in the 30s, yes, there was acrimony. I think there was a kind of jealousy and there's a transcript in the Princeton archives, which is unpublished in which they negotiate this. And he more or less does not want her to write novels anymore, but as the bargain, he agrees to get her short stories, um, her first art show and a play, all of which she does immediately. Um, so they do strike this uncomfortable bargain and they never did divorce. Uh, they did effectively separate in 36 when he goes out to Hollywood, and then she was in North Carolina. So I wanted, you touched on um, how they went to Europe, because he did go to mm -hmm. Paris, and is that where yeah. he began writing The Great Gatsby? Yeah, he writes Gatsby uh, while in Europe. They travel, they, they were very um, nomadic. They never really stayed anywhere for very long. In the U.S., on average, they only stay places about six months. And part of the reason they go to Europe, um, it was cheaper post-war, Europe was much cheaper. I think people, I think the idea of their money problems is slightly exaggerated. They, they went through money, but he was also making a lot of money. Um, but one of the other reasons they go to Europe is prohibition. Prohibition hits in 1920. Um, and you have, you know, what's later coined the lost generation are all in Europe. So they, they go to Europe for a variety of reasons. And yes, it is um, in France that he writes Gatsby. And now the great, the great Gatsby has become Scott's most known book, his famous book, Required yeah. Reading, even when I was in high school. During the time when it first came out, other writers like Willa Cather and Edith Wharton praised the book. But it wasn't really a success at the time, correct? When it first came out? Yeah, it, it, yes and no. Nothing was the success of This Side of Paradise. I, this Side of Paradise, his first novel, was his greatest commercial success during his life. But um, the, it's kind of yes and no. 
One thing is the play. It was first a Broadway play and then a silent film. And those were extremely successful. Uh, it was a hit play. Uh, the play was directed by a very young George Cooker. It was like his second, his second directing job. Um, and he goes on to, you know, do Gone with the Wind and whatnot. And, you know, that's where the, the liaison between Fitzgerald and Cooker is. But as a book, no. And, and when you look at the advertisements for the film, Gatsby was kind of sold as a satire, which we don't get at all today. But almost everyone in the novel was based on somewhat of a public figure. Um, I think the one that people most mistake is Wolfsheim is based on the gangster uh, Arnold Rothstein. There's always that question in Gatsby, is Wolfsheim, because he's made Jewish, is this anti-Semitic or whatnot? But they don't know when Gatsby says, this is the guy that fixed the 1919 World Series, everyone knows it's Arnold Rothstein. He was one of the most powerful gangs or mobsters in the U.S. at that time. Uh, Daisy's based on Ginevra King, a socialite. Her husband, uh, Winchell, was a very prominent polo player. Almost, er And then um, Ginevra King's close friend was Edith Cummings, who's the basis for Jordan. Edith Cummings was um, a golfer. She's not only the first woman on Time Magazine, but the first golfer on Time Magazine. So when people see Gatsby, when they read Gatsby, it was very close to home. And I think that may have had, you know, satire doesn't always go down well, if that makes sense. It does. And did did Scott have, what, what was his relationship with other writers like? Because I know that he did, he was friends with Ernest Hemingway while he was yeah. in Paris, part of the Lost Generation. Yeah. He was friends with quite a number of um uh, you know, I think like uh, Dos Passos, he was very good friends with the sports writer Ring Lardner. Um, most people don't realize that Fitzgerald was kind of an early patron of Hemingway, and that's in part their falling out um, was because, uh, I mean, Hemingway's a complicated figure. They were very close, and then, of course, they, they have a falling out. Um, the Fitzgeralds also knew and were friends of... Um, the Murphys, Gerald Murphy and his wife, who were in a way patrons to quite a number of authors at that time. And that's where uh, the Fitzgeralds also meet Picasso. And of course there's the connection to Gertrude Stein. Uh, Fitzgerald scholars are not entirely sure how the Fitzgeralds met Gertrude Stein because you had to have a letter introduction to her. And another connection to Zelda and Montgomery is, um, I've just gone blank on the name, there's uh, Anne Goldwaite. Anne Goldwaite was a contemporary of Zelda's mother and is, most people don't know her, but she's probably the first American woman to earn her living as a painter. And she, Goldwaite's new Gertrude Stein met her in the Luxembourg Gardens. Um, she wins a number of international medals and is a very prominent painter in the U.S. She's not very well known today. And we think there's a great possibility that the Fitzgeralds were introduced to Gertrude Stein through Zelda's connections and Montgomery was Anne Goldwaite. Oh, okay. Yeah, because, mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, that was an amazing group of writers, the Lost Generation. Yeah. yeah. And I, I could imagine a lot of ego going on there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, even though I don't think it, it is not entirely accurate. Um, I think the portrayal, particularly of Zelda in Midnight in Paris, is very skewed. But, you know, the scenes with them and Hemingway talking to himself, it's just delightful, you know. So I think that's one of like, the most greatest fantasy depictions of the Lost Generations. Yeah. You talked a little already about uh, Scott being in Hollywood. What was mm -hmm. his What was his career like as a screenwriter? Did he have much success? Mm, not really. Yes and no. I think in many ways he was well respected. I think um, he he was a script doctor on Gone with the Wind. Uh, most people don't know that Clark Gable wanted to play Gatsby in the '30s and he was refused the rights, I think, by Warner Brothers. So then he does this movie called Gone with the Wind. And he has Cooker. And when Cooker is fired, it's a little more complicated. But Scott was a script doctor on it. Um, and he he has this kind of varied career. But I think his prose 
we and I'll explain this. We recently did um, re had actors do the readings, like radio plays of Scott's stories from Tales of the Jazz Age and Flappers and Philosophers. And some of these are very seasoned Shakespearean actors, and they had a hard time with reading some of it. And like I said before, there is a transcript of the Fitzgeralds, and when you read it, you realize that Scott actually talked that way. Like, you know, he's a very elegant speaker. Um, and there, there is some audio of him reading uh, Shakespeare and Keats. People can find it online. There's four recordings. But I don't think that his style of writing was, um, I think it was difficult for actors. And then he was also, most people think that drink killed him. It didn't. The Fitzgeralds were chain smokers. And he has a mild heart attack. And then he does die in Hollywood. Um, so I think he was he was kind of in this awkward cycle of failing health, kind of um, creative frustration, maybe. So his time in Hollywood as a script writer, I think, was fraught. But while he's there, he writes the Pat Hobby stories. He, he's a writer for Esquire. And those are very um, interesting stories if people don't know them. And then, of course, he has his unfinished final novel, The Last Tycoon, that he writes while he's in Hollywood. So as a script writer, no, but creatively, yes. What do you think he would have thought about The Great Gatsby being made I, in all these uh, different versions of the movies? Uh, I think he'd be very pleased. I think he was, um, I think he believed it was his best work. And I think he was disappointed that it wasn't better received. Also, we have here in the museum a copy. The way that Gatsby goes global is in World War II. Um, we have the Armed Services Edition. It's a very small um, paperback, um, and it would fit in soldiers' pockets. And 150,000 of those were printed and distributed to Allied forces in World War II. And that's what sparks both the Fitzgerald and the Gatsby revival. And I think one... Um, it just was very well beloved by the troops. And so I think, again, what most people don't realize is how important being a veteran was to him. And the fact that, that, that basically his revival comes through the Armed Services Edition, I think he would have been very proud. So toward the, the end of their lives, um, I think, both, well, did Scott suffer from depression as much as Zelda did? I mean, is that a fair <clears throat> analysis of... Um, I, th I think when they leave Montgomery and go to Baltimore, Zelda had been misdiagnosed as schizophrenic in um, Switzerland. And there's a lot, um, there's a, there's a, it was just very bad medicine, let's put it that way. And when they go to Baltimore, I don't think most Fitzgerald fans know this, but her doctors in Baltimore did not believe she was schizophrenic and believe she was just suffering from depression because their, their marriage was unraveling. And at that time, she was inpatient, but most people don't realize he was outpatient. Um, and I think that's the worst. People think of Scott Fitzgerald as having been alcoholic, but no, you, you have like, I think that was the lowest for both of them physically and emotionally. Um, so I think it's like anyone that has depression, you have like the work, you know, there's, you have ups and downs in life. And I think when they're in Baltimore is the absolute lowest and they do strike this bargain and they do in part remain friends. I think he struggled more than her. I think people would find that strange. They think that she was, uh, institutionalized. She wasn't, um, where she was in in North Carolina was very um, country club, shall we say, at Highland Hospital. Whereas Scott um, and their daughter was at, in private school and boarding school and then at Vassar. Uh, so Scott, to his credit, kept both Scotty and Zelda very comfortable. And I think that took a greater toll on him. I think people think that Zelda was locked away, institutionalized, and that she's a more tragic figure. But I don't think he gets credit to how hard he worked to keep both Zelda and his daughter comfortable. Yeah, and thank you for clearing up all of that, because I, I too, think of yeah. Zelda. Whenever you think of her, you think of a tragic figure, and you don't really yeah, get too much. very tragically, but um, she, we're working on it now. We believe, well, we know that she was misdiagnosed, 
Uh, I thought I could hear I have a jet flying over. <laughs> um, she was misdiagnosed as schizophrenic. I think the Milford biography, the Milford biography is very tricky um, in that we owe this huge debt of gratitude to Milford for, for basically, people don't know it's the, the biography of Zelda, which came out in 1970. Uh, it was a bestseller, and it was incredibly influential, and it, it really revived Zelda in the public imagination. So in that way, we owe her great debt of gratitude. But she kind of does two things. She she goes really hard that Zelda was schizophrenic, and the medical records are just not there for it. Um, but if you think that novel, was, that, that biography, rather, was written in 69, what we understand today about schizophrenia versus what was known in 1969-70 versus what was known in 1930-31, I mean, it's just the progress is great. Um, the other is that she puts forward the idea that Zelda tried to become a ballerina late in life. And those are just not accurate. But Zelda did die at Highland Hospital. Um, what people don't realize is the reason Zelda was there is because she could afford to be. Um, it was in today's money about eight ten thousand dollars a month to be there. Very very comfortable. She was never. Um, and the the reason that she was locked in a ward is she had been sedated earlier. Um, for a treatment. We're not 100% sure what that was. It may have been an insulin shock therapy, which they put you in an insulin-induced coma, which today is medical malpractice. We think she most likely died with early onset dementia because of the insulin shock therapies. It was, it was, um, and some people think she was given it because she was a woman, but that's not true either. John Nash, which most people know from A Beautiful Mind in Princeton, he had them, Nijinsky had them. It was kind of this wealthy treatment. But regardless, she'd been sedated that day, and the building she was in was four stories. And so what we would now call a recovery ward was locked because one of the floors in that building had people who were potentially violent. So she was not actually locked in. It was unfortunately people were locked out, which inadvertently made her locked in. And the night nurse had some kind of argument or beef with the night guard. And she started a fire to get him in trouble. And it got out of hand. And Zelda and eight other women perished in that fire. Wow. But it's the difference between factual and accurate. People think that she died, died locked away in an asylum. Right. Um, and again, there's, you know, factual versus accurate. Uh, when she was at Highland Hospital, she walked miles a day. Most people don't know the Fitzgeralds are incredibly athletic and very active people. Uh, she painted, she danced, she choreographed while she was there. She would go in and out of town to movies. Um, but on that day, she happened to be in the recovery ward. And Scott died out in Hollywood, you said? Yeah, he died in December 40. He had a minor heart attack again. They were chain smokers. Um, and he was kind of at that stage a night drinker. So he would work all day. Um, and then he has this minor heart attack and the doctor puts him on a diet of steak and eggs. And then he's gone like a month later wow. of a fatal heart attack. Yeah, that'll do it. <laughs> so they were both victims of very bad medicine. Uh, Zelda dies in March of 48. And uh, she was already back in Montgomery when Scott dies. And the biography, Zelda's biographies almost all end when Scott dies. But she was another seven, eight years, a little over eight years. And um, she had a very creative life in Montgomery. She um, began painting. Most of her paintings are from that time period. She um, began, she uh, joined the Press and Authors Club. She gave lectures at a local college here to the English department at Huntington College. Most people know Harper Lee. Harper Lee and her sister Alice attended Huntington. We know that Zelda gave lectures in the year that Harper Lee was here before she transferred to Alabama. Zelda also gave um, book reviews for uh, Armed Forces Radio. And when we're, one of their friends, Vici comes, um, it's one of the authors that they knew the 
the armed services sent him on this book tour to address the troops and Zelda drove him out to Tuskegee to address the Tuskegee Airmen. So after Scott's death, she lives this very productive, albeit much quieter life, but very um, comfortable life and very uh, artistically um, creative and productive. And you don't really hear anything about that from Zelda. No, you really don't. I was yeah. just familiar with all the tragic parts of her life. Yeah. And had no idea how productive she was. Uh, yeah. Now, what happened to their daughter once they, they both passed away? Did she ever become a writer herself? Yeah, Scotty um, was at Vassar when Scott dies. The Obers, who were Scott's agent, and some of Scott's friends effectively adopt her. Um, she and Zelda, I don't think, had a great relationship at that time. Again, Zelda had something like 30 insulin shocks, which is an insulin-induced coma, which is medical malpractice today. So um, I'm not saying that Zelda didn't have or didn't struggle with certain issues, but most of them were medically done to her. So Scotty went on to marry um, a formal, uh, I think he was a Navy guy. He becomes a Sam McLanahan, who's a prominent DC lawyer. And um, Scotty, I think even when Scott was alive, wrote for, um, I think, Mademoiselle. She begins, she works for the New Yorker, but she eventually had uh, a national column with the Washington Post. Scotty, unlike her parents, was very political. She was a major Democratic fundraiser in D.C. Um, she wrote plays and whatnot for um, like the DNC for their fundraisers. But when she and her husband divorced in the late 60s, she moved back to Montgomery and lived here until her death. And then here she... Um, she wrote a book about her time in D.C. And it says, I think it's called Can You Quote Me or You Can Quote Me. People can find it, Scotty, uh, Scotty Fitzgerald Lanahan. And then when she remarried, it was Scotty Smith, Scotty um, Lanahan Smith. Um, and then in Montgomery, she, she did the book The Romantic Egoist, which is a compilation of Scott and Zelda's um, biography, uh, their, their scrapbooks. And she kind of started her own autobiography, but she died of cancer in 86. And her daughter, Eleanor Lanahan, kind of completed, well, she completed it, and it's called Scotty, the Daughter of. So people can read that. And then finally, um, Eleanor Lanahan, which is the eldest of the Fitzgerald grandchildren, she wrote a book on Zelda's art called The Illustrated Life. And then just um, in November, just a few weeks ago, she now has a book out on Zelda's paper dolls. Oh, wow. So there's quite a number. People can find it on Amazon. But um, so if you're interested in Zelda's art, Eleanor has written about her, her mother, but then also um, Zelda's art. Hey, can you tell me a little about the museum and, and what people can expect when they visit? Yeah, we're located in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, the Fitzgeralds lived here in the house from 1931 to 32. Um, when you come to the house, the museum is primarily on the ground floor. It's quite a large house. The Fitzgeralds were the last to live in the house and the man that owned it was a widower. And when they moved out, he had the house split into four apartments. So on the ground floor, each of our rooms has a different time period or theme, which essentially follows their novel, it's semi-chronological. And then we have a room dedicated to Scotty, which has a childhood theme. She was a child here. And then we have uh, Zelda's art gallery. We have 12 of uh, Zelda's original artworks. And then we have quite a number of her personal items in there from her flapper headband, her, um, you know, the long cigarette holder to some of her perfume bottles, that kind of thing. But on the, the second story, we have the two apartments, which are known as the Scott and Zelda Suite, which are Airbnb. So you can come stay with us here in the house. Um, in terms of our collection, we have, um, we have all the first editions. We have a signed author's apology, which is technically the second edition of The Side of Paradise. Um, again, it was such a runaway bestseller, it was printed almost immediately. And so in that second reprinting, uh, a plate was inserted called the author's apology where Scott kind of apologizes for being so successful, but he signed them all. 
Um, we skew slightly more to Zelda because this was Zelda's hometown. The furniture on the ground floor of the house is the furniture from Zelda's childhood home. Her home at Pleasant Avenue, their daughter Scotty tried to save it but couldn't. The interstate went through. And so um, we have um, furniture, but also pieces of that house here. And we have some of their clothing. I'm trying to think. We have Scott's writing pen and then um, other artifacts. So do you get many writers who want to come and stay in the Fitzgerald room? Yeah, we do. We have some people have um, like a writer's residency. They'll come stay a week at a time. We have a lot of teachers. We began um, a, teaching the Great Gatsby Conference last year. It was the first year for high school teachers. So um, hopefully we'll have it again next year. But uh, pre-COVID, we had a lot of... Um, it was very interesting from Northern Europe, a lot of teenagers who had read, um, particularly young men from Germany, Sweden, Norway, Germany, um, they come on the Southern Literary Trail. We're part of the Southern Literary Trail and a lot of Scandinavian countries, um, a lot of young men would come for that trail for Faulkner. And they consider Scott in some ways a Southern writer because he's on that, on it. but yeah, we have a lot of, um, Young men come for Scott and then a lot of like French and a lot of Chinese and Asian writer, female writers come for Zelda. Wow, it sounds amazing. And I've actually seen video of it. I watch um, another YouTube channel called Jordan the Lion. And yes, he, prisoners, yeah. yes, he stayed um, in there. He stayed in the uh, the Scott suite, I think. I think, yeah, he stayed in, he stayed in each. Unfortunately, we had to, you know, there was that COVID wave last year and we had to cancel our New Year's Eve party and he came for it. But so I, he, he's, he's, he's done both suites, Scott and Zelda. Well, Elena, thank you so much for coming on and talking about oh, Scott you. and Zelda. I really appreciate it, talking about the museum and dispelling so many of the myths and rumors that we have all become accustomed to. And yeah. getting to know the real, you know, you gave us an opportunity to know the real Zelda and Scott. So I want to thank you so much for being on today. Oh, well, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. Thank you.